Okay. Shall we start again? Hello. Is there any chairman clapping hands around? <laughs> Okay, maybe I, I, several people have came to me a little bit, um, so with a, let's say, a question mark in their heads of what do I mean by non-Markovian, right? Because, and, and also I, one has to say that the literature is not super, super clear about that. And uh, let me clarify this a little bit. So, um, so there are, in my opinion, um, three main concepts of non-Markovianity. One is, I would say, the traditional concept. Uh, when I was doing my PhD, my PhD was on, already on non-Markovian open quantum systems. And by the way, everyone was asking me, why do you need that? <laughs> so it was kind of, uh, uh, well, th th those were the times where um, people were thinking about open quantum systems in quantum optics. And you know, in quantum optics, things are very, very Markovian. And at that time, by non-Markovian, we were referring to those uh, systems or to those dynamics where you, you cannot actually properly use the Limland equation, right? So in that sense, uh, this concept is very, very close to a paper by, by Jens Eisert, Ignacio, Sirac, uh, where they actually propose uh, a measure of uh, non-Markovianity that is related to whether your evolution can be properly described in terms of, uh, of this uh, dynamical semi-group or Limbland equation. So this is the first. Um, the first definition of uh, non-Markovianity, or let me not call it definition, but the first thing that people were thinking about when uh, the classifying the systems between non-Markovian and Markovian. And then there was this, uh, this let's say, um, well, this emergence of non-Markovianity measures. And I would say they are mostly divided into two main groups. One is that in which people consider uh, non-Markovian those, uh, those dynamics that cannot be described with a divisible map. And this was first proposed by, by Rivas, uh, Huelga, and Plenio. And this is, by the way, what I was explaining to you earlier, the fact that, um, well, I think it's pretty, it's pretty useful, non-divisible, I remind you, is whether when a map is divisible, you can always decompose it into, into little pieces. into little pieces, and more and more little pieces if you want. And each of these pieces is a dynamical map. And why is this important is because if you have a, a, a quantum information protocol uh, and you have this property, you can actually use these little pieces uh, in between operations over on your qubit. Um, and it is important, that, again, that these are well-defined dynamical maps because otherwise, uh, these guys would be crazy. They would do crazy things to your reduced density matrix. They, it would uh, transform your reduced density matrix into something that is not a well-defined reduced density matrix. This is why it is so important to have pieces that are well-defined dynamical maps that preserve the w nice properties of the reduced density matrix when applied to it. And then there is this, uh, this other measure which is based on the backflow of information. And this was proposed by Breuer, Leine, and Filo uh, from Freiburg and, uh, and Finland. Um, and it's based mostly on uh, whether uh, when your open quantum system is coupled to the environment, whether there is uh, not only the information is flying or flowing from the system to the environment, as it happens, um, as it happens in, in many different cases, but also there is some backflow of the very same information back to the system during the, the evolution. Um, therefore, 
you see you have the same names to, for three different things. So, and people then try to, to see uh, what is the relationship between these uh, concepts and so on. But I think the best thing to keep in mind is that they are somehow linked by the fact that, um, well, in general, non-Markovian environments have a certain memory, and because they have a certain memory, there can be some backflow of information because the environment actually remembers. And, uh, and in connection to this, um, the fact that you can divide into pieces the map, it means that somehow the environment is recovering pretty well from the interaction with the system. And it is a good approximation to consider that from one piece of time to the next, the environment has uh, recoiled back to, to its equilibrium state. Roughly speaking, please allow me the inconsistencies or the inaccuracies in this explanation, but this is just to more or less give you some physical ideas. Okay, so any questions so far or has this been clarifying or hopefully not unclarifying at least? Okay, um, so let me, let me go now to the next uh, part. We have, I think, 25 minutes until the coffee break, which is very encouraging. And uh, well, we have seen that uh, we have different types of environments, uh, but many, many of them can be described as a set of independent harmonic oscillators uh, that are uh, kind of connected uh, to, the, to the system in this kind of a star configuration. Uh, well, question so far here, I added some slides to, to well, trying to, to ask you questions. Uh, so what is uh, the only thing we need to know so that we can properly describe our, uh, our dynamics with a universal dynamical map? Well, it's actually that the initial condition is decorrelated, although, although there, are, uh, there are examples in which you can also derive a sort of a map or a combination of maps for more complex initially correlated states. But also you need to, to, to think that the universe is quantum, no? Uh, this is the only assumption that we have so far um, to describe uh, everything in terms of a dynamical map. The fact that, uh, that it's written in terms of Krauss operators, and remember that these Krauss operators are related to the unitary evolution operator for both the system and the environment. So we need the environment to be quantum also. But okay, we all agree that quantum theory so far has worked pretty well. Ah, why the harmonic environment model is so successful? Mm, any ideas about that? Why Gaussian statistics are so nice? Well, um, this is related to the central limit theorem. Uh, so in a sense, when you have a complex system with many, many degrees of freedom and you go to the thermodynamic limit where you have many entities in, in your system, in this case in your environment, then uh, the statistics tend to be Gaussian. And this is what, uh, what lies be below this, this harmonic, uh, the success of the harmonic assumption. Um, what, inf what, I mean, you know, when you think about a, a, a quantum information protocol, and people are applying maps and maps and maps uh, in between unitaries on the, on the qubit. The assumption that is below that is that somehow uh, we can uh, describe uh, this um, environment in terms of a dynamical semigroup. This is something that we just saw before. And well, just uh, to catch up with you, um, well, when we have a, a closed system, this can be written in terms of a pure state, but here we need to, uh, to deal with, uh, with the reduced density matrix. This is just, this was meant to be a catch up slide in between two blocks of the, of the talk. Um, by the way, um, just to mention here, um, before I was saying, look, uh, if, you have, uh, if, you, if you have an environment, and this is the total Hamiltonian, for some reason the laser is, is uh, I think it's, well, it's disappearing. Um, well, you can dis uh, solve the full dynamics of the system and the environment with the total Schrodinger equation, but just to let you know that it could also be <laughs> the case that your um, environment and your system are described or have to be described not with a pure state psi of t, 
but with a reduced, uh, not a reduced, but with a density matrix, because it could be a mixed state. Um, well, why? Because you could initially start from your universe being composed of still the open system and the environment, but the initial state that we would be considering, this is the total density matrix, being a mixed state that is still a decorrelated state between the system and the environment. And this is, by the way, the situation we were considering before, that the environment is in a thermal state. It's actually exponential of minus beta, H, did I call this E? Sometimes I say E or B, divided by the partition function. Okay? Yes. Yes. Yes, so far, yes. Uh, indeed, there are many works uh, in which uh, people uh, have considered more general initial conditions. Um, this only makes things more complicated. <laughs> I'm going to approach because some. Yes. If you consider an initial entangled state between the environment and the system, uh, things, I mean, you, you would have more, more complicated uh, equations. So, um, well, you can still extract the reduced dynamics of the, of the open system, but uh, you would not, for instance, be able to describe everything in terms of a single dynamical map, for instance, yes. Okay, but so far the, the, the situation I've been considering is kind of the quantum thermodynamical situation where you have an open system that is coupled to a reservoir, and this reservoir is in an equilibrium state, a thermal equilibrium state, for instance. And the only thing I'm saying here in this slide is, uh, look, when you think about the total, uh, the total evolution, and you start from an initial state which is uh, not a... a um, it's not a, um, a pure state, but the mixed state, you have to consider this von Neumann equation, okay, with the total Hamiltonian here. This is just what I was saying. Okay, and we have seen that we have this general form of the Hamiltonian in which the environment is Gaussian, has Gaussian statistics. And, uh, and the point is, uh, again, that uh, we want to be able to solve the dynamics of the open system in its reduced Hilbert space, and we want to simply use as the statistical properties of the environment, these correlation functions, uh, in particular, this second order moment for the Gaussian environments. Um, and now, okay, what do we do? How can we have access to the dynamical equations of the open system? Remember at the beginning I was telling you, well, uh, in most of the cases what you need is to uh, make some sort of assumption um, that actually has to do with uh, considering this coupling strength between the system and the environment to be, uh, to be weak. And what does it mean weak is, uh, is what I will explain now in, in a minute. So uh, remember we, we have uh, two different time scales uh, that are relevant in our problem. So we have an environment relaxation time, which is the decay time of the correlation function which is, roughly speaking, the time that the environment takes to bounce back to its equilibrium state, to its give state. And then, uh, as you will see later on, now it's hard to, <laughs> to justify this uh, without actually having seen the dynamical equations of the open system, but you have to believe me that the evolution or relaxation time of your open system is related to, uh, to the inverse of the integral of the correlation function. Which is kind of funny because this means that somehow the correlation function is going to be key to uh, determine the two main time scales of the problem, namely the relaxation time scale of the environment and the relaxation time scale of the system. And by the way, I'm going to define a weak coupling parameter, which is G. I'm sorry that the laser is, is not uh, really 
helpful. Um, that is related to well uh, to the to the relaxation time of the system. This is uh, what we call the weak coupling parameter, in which we will make perturbative expansions of our equations, and therefore we will be able to have well-defined uh, master equations for the reduced density operator of the system. And as you may imagine, there are uh, three different uh, well three different regimes. We are going to be focusing on the weak coupling and Markov limit. These two regimes correspond to cases in which there is a large separation of evolution time scales, in which we can basically assume that the environment is recovering very, very fast in the weak coupling case or almost instantaneously in the Markov limit from the interaction with the system. And later on, you will see how awful things become when you, uh, well, at least you will, you will get some ideas of how things become when you are in the strong coupling regime. Yeah? Well, <laughs> that's also a very good question. Tricky one. Um, I would say, uh, in the Markov limit, well, let me start with the weak coupling, okay? What you assume is that, uh, uh, roughly speaking, um, you assume the Born approximation. This Born approximation is, uh, as you will see later in a couple of slides, have to do with neglecting correlations between the system and the environment um, beyond second order in G, in this coupling parameter that we have there. So this Born approximation is allowing you to consider the correlations between the system and the environment that occur at very initial times, so to say, uh, until the environment uh, relaxes back to its equilibrium state. And actually, the Markov uh, approximation is assuming even more. It's uh, assuming that uh, during the evolution, the total density matrix can more or less be approximated. This is also something that is assumed in quantum thermodynamics in the Markovian uh, interpretation or of quantum thermodynamics, can more or less be written as a product between the system and the environment uh, state. And the environment is usually considered to be, um, to be remaining in equilibrium. This is more or less the assumption that is behind quantum thermodynamics in the Markov limit, which is where uh, the different laws of thermodynamics are, are justified. Um, it's much stronger, of course, than uh, the Born approximation. But we, we will see this later on uh, in more detail. OK, so let me, um, let me um, go a little bit to explain this. This is a, a little bit of a stupid slide. <laughs> With uh, so that you visualize the open system is a turtle and the environment is a bunny, um, and well, uh, the nice thing about these approximations is that the dynamical map is reachable. You can really reach the master equation and the dynamical map, and um, um, and actually in the Markov limit, in in the limit where you have a Markov approximation and actually another one that is called the secular approximation that uh, we will discuss. Uh, we will not discuss in detail, but it's related to total energy conservation of the full system and the environment, uh, the, the map will become a dynamical semigroup. And then, and then now we connect a little bit with this concept of noise, right? Because, um, well, so far we have been talking about master equations, uh, the evolution of the reduced density matrix of the system. But just to let you know, we will also check a little bit uh, this other way of expressing the reduced density matrix. Actually, this is called unraveling. So this, this was a terminology that was coined by Carl Michael in the, in the 90s. You can also consider uh, the reduced density matrix to be written or unraveled in terms of projections over stochastic wave vectors. So this J stands for each of the stochastic trajectories in which you may unravel 
um, your reduced density matrix, and which in the Markov limit can be made to correspond to the trajectories that you obtain in each experimental run, only in the Markov limit. We will discuss a little bit uh, also today. So you see there are two different, uh, two different type of, uh, or two different ways to access the open system dynamics, in particular the reduced density matrix. One is through computing the reduced density matrix, which by the way, just for, for those of you that are not so familiar, this allows you to calculate the quantum mean value of any operator of the system, A, just because this is written as a total trace over the environment and the system of the total density matrix times A, but this is equal to a trace over the system of a trace over the environment, because A is a system operator of rho t, okay? And this simply is rho s of t. So you see that the reduced density matrix um, is actually allowing you to recover any quantum mean value of a system operator A. And so you can compute this rho s of t with master equation and with stochastic Schrodinger equations that are driven by a noise. So this is the connection with, with noise, okay? And um, so how can we access master equation? Just very briefly because, uh, well, it's no, not a question today to, to come into details. But the idea is to remember this von Neumann equation for the total density matrix of the system and the environment. What you do is you uh, expand it up to second order in the coupling parameters. So every time there is an interaction Hamiltonian, you have to think that this is proportional in magnitude to G. So this means that this term is of second order in G, at least, because you have twice the interaction Hamiltonian. I have changed a little bit the notation just to, um, uh, I realize it's to confuse you. <laughs> uh, this, uh, well, the evolution with respect to the free Hamiltonian, um, I'm sorry about the laser, is written as Bt over A, acting over the next uh, operator, v, v, t, v tau Vt. So this means that this equation, um, I have to ask for another laser, but, uh, well, this equation is in principle dependent on some operators, uh, so some, uh, so the interaction Hamiltonian evolved in time with respect to the free part of the Hamiltonian, the Hs plus He. But here you have the total density operator, right? Uh, and by the way, what we are going to consider is the case where you have an interaction Hamiltonian which describes the um, different particles J coupled to the field. Uh, like for instance, when you have a photosynthetic complex of antenna molecules, J stands for each antenna molecule. And uh, what, what you have is that, uh, well, for instance, this is uh, for the uh, um, Fena Matthew Olson uh, complex of antenna molecules found in purple bacteria. Uh, these guys are actually um, receiving light from the sun and uh, they are transporting this light into a reaction center uh, which uh, should be somewhere here and um, in the, within the complex and um, this transport process is occurring in the presence of a phononic environment. So this is the interaction Hamiltonian between the antenna molecules and the phononic environment uh, where the phononic uh, coupling operator is B, right? The environment coupling operator. And uh, this is where the Born, Born approximation is coming into play, as we were mentioning before. So as you can see, it's coming into play by uh, replacing this total density matrix that corresponds to both the system and the environment by uh, the correlated version of it. So it's a soft version of this assumption where you assume that uh, every time you are having such a decomposition and it's softer version because 
somehow uh, you are making such a replacement in a term that is already of second order within an evolution equation. So in a sense, this means that you are considering uh, correlations up to second order, if you like. And you are neglecting whatever correlations because once they are plugged here, they would be a fourth order term. Okay? Good. So, and then what you get is uh, what is called a weak coupling master equation. It's kind of uh, interesting because, well, here I have already replaced the form of the interaction Hamiltonian here and here. And this is how you have uh, in this equation only the system operators, the system coupling operators, SJ and SL. And the environment coupling operators have gone through the trace uh, to this correlation function, which uh, I should have written, but it's uh, really looking like this. So this um, CLJ of T is a trace over the environment of the uh, initial state of the environment times B L T B J zero, where this guy is the exponential of minus I H E T B L. I think this should be plus. Right, so this is a correlation function that, uh, well, it's a second order moment, if you like, or a fluctuation of the environment coupling operators uh, corresponding to the particle L and the particle J. So it's a kind of very, very nice object because it connects different particles. It connects different antenna molecules through the field. So even if they were not connected through this coupling, through the hoping process, they would be connected by the phononic field um, through the fact that you have uh, these uh, correlation functions, um, well, that depend on, on different, uh, that connects different uh, particles. And as you can see, thanks to having considered the Born approximation, which is uh, kind of uh, equivalent to a second order perturbative expansion, we have obtained a master equation in the reduced Hilbert space of the system. So this equation is only given in the Hilbert space of the open quantum system because it only depends on reduced density matrix and operators of the open quantum system. And all the information of the environment, as I was announcing earlier, is encoded in this correlation function, which is a second order moment or a fluctuation of the environment coupling operators connecting between different particles. And uh, it's probably, I think, a good moment to, to stop for the coffee break. It's, I'm correct, it's now at, at 11. Yes? Okay, so, so well, is, is there any question? We have three minutes for a question. <laughs> it's probably more important to get the coffee, no? <laughs> okay, so we will resume in half an hour, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.